Well, for those of you who are following on um, YouTube and Facebook, welcome. It's, uh, was it the Sunday, the 2nd? Second? Second, 2nd of July, 2023. Where do all the years go? I don't know. <laughs> I wonder how many sermons you listen to. Um, I'm hoping you find this one today helpful. If you've not heard me before, I'm Dr. John Clements. I'm the pastor of the Old Meeting House Congregational Church in Colgate, Norwich. It's a fellowship that was gathered together during a time of religious persecution way back in 1643. So we're kind of old and we're quite proud of it. And uh, we're a group of Christians here who actually love the Bible. This chapel was built on something known as Sola Scriptura, which means, what does it mean? By the word of God alone? No, by the word, of, by the word alone. By the word alone. Yeah. So that's what we believe. And um, this is part of a series of talks, um, and today on spiritual armour, and today I'm looking at the shield of faith which we read about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16. Here's the verse. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, I wonder, did the apostle who gave this counsel or advice, contained in the scripture, find that his faith shield met all his needs. I'm, I'm going to have to sit. Um, I'm still recovering from cancer, so I, I need to sit down. Could, could you just come and re reposition this? Sorry. I'm going to find it easier to preach sitting down. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> it's my great age. A bit further, but just push it forward. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, I'll just get in the make sure, make sure to turn it a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. Like Down, it's, it bends. That'll yeah. do. That'll yeah. do. Yeah. Think, okay, there. Okay. I think that should okay. do. Yeah. Sorry about take, that. One, Slight one, interruption. One, yeah. Forgive me. <laughs> I'm getting old in the tooth. <laughs> oh, no, long in the tooth is what they say. So uh, let's start here. So. I was just asking, did Paul, who gave us this advice about the shield of faith, did it meet his spiritual needs? He recommends the shield of faith to others, but was this recommendation based on his own personal experience? We often do that, don't we, tell people, but unless we've borne it out in our own lives, what worth is it? And if so, what is the nature and value of that experience? What sorts of protection did his faith give him? When we examine his life, what signs do we find of the shield of faith as a strong defence? When we move through the ways of his duties and experience of life, it is like passing through Quiet, is it like passing through quiet and shady cloisters, shut away from the noise and heat of the fierce and feverish world? No, he didn't live such an idyllic life. Is, he, is his life protected like a, a garden walled around him, which is full of sweet and pleasant things and secured against robbers, and wild animals. Let us examine this protected life. Let us glance at the outer circumstances. Here's just one glimpse of his experience, which we read about in 2 Corinthians 11 and verses 24 to 7. I guess many of us know this. Five times 
I've received from the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. And yet, this is a man who speaks about the shield of faith. And in spite of the protecting shield, all these things have happened to him. Gosh. We would naturally think that it would protect him. But let's look at the following list. And perhaps we'll be, we'll be wondering why the shield of faith is so important when it seems to be so ineffective. To start with, what about his bodily infirmities? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10, we read very familiar verses. Therefore, in, able, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Absolutely fabulous words, aren't they? Where was the shield of faith? It was not necessary. It's not necessary for us to know the character of this thorn, but assuredly it was some ailment which appeared to interfere with his work and life. Some think it was an affliction of the eyes. Others think it was a proneness to some form of malarial fever, which frequently brought him into a state of collapse and exhaustion. But there it was, and the shield of faith did not keep it away. Or look again at his extensive efforts. There's no word concerning his ministry with greater meaning than this word, labour. Some of us know all about work, don't we? Never comes work hard. Work, yeah. <laughs> Manual work, especially. But mental work's just as taxing. For example, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29, we read, To this end I strenuously contended with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, we read, But the grace of God, but that by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was, was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. This is not the labour of ordinary toil. It was the labour of travail. It is a labour to a degree of point of pain. It is a labour of great sacrifice. And we might have thought that perhaps the shield of faith would have protected his life and he might have been spared the suffering of a living martyrdom and that the service uh, um, of such a man rendered might have been made fruitful without paying such a price. We might be forgiven in thinking that God might have protected his servant, but the shield of faith did not deliver him from the labour of travail through which he sought the birth of the children of grace. Or look again 
is his repeated failures. We're all good at that, aren't we? I know I am. You can hear the wail of sadness as he frequently contemplates his ruined hopes concerning little churches which he had built or concerning fellow believers who he had won to Christ. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 we read, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And the scriptures goes on to say, chapter 4 and verse 15, Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. And the Apostle goes on in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18, to say, In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. And finally, he says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, Demas has deserted me. He loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. And the list of moans goes moan after moan for its failure after failure. Defeat is piled upon defeat. It's declared to be a protected life, the Christian life, with the shield of faith. And yet it appears to be disasters glitter the entire way. It's perfectly clear that the shield of faith did not guard him from the agony of defeat. Sure, such are the experiences of all of us, and especially of Paul, who gave his strength to proclaim the all-sufficiency of the shield of faith, who spent his days in recommending it to his fellow men, and whose own life was full of disasters and difficulties and crippled by infirmity. Can this life, they say, be wearing a shield? We have so far been looking at the man's environment, at his bodily infirmities, at his activities of labour and at his external defeats. But what if all these things, we have, we have not yet come within sight of the realm which the apostle would describe his life. When Paul speaks of life, he means the life of the soul. When he thinks of life, his eyes are on the soul. In all the estimates and values which he makes of his life, he's concentrating on the soul. The question of success or failure in life is judged by him in the courthouse of the soul. You cannot entice the apostle away to life's accidents and prompt him to take his measurements there. He always measures life with the measurement of an angel. And so he bruises himself, not with the scale of possessions, but the quality of being. Not where the outer properties of circumstances, but with a central keep and citadel of the soul. We never find the Apostle Paul with his eyes glued upon the wealth, uh, wealth or poverty of his surroundings. For everywhere and always, and with endless fascination, he watches the growth or decay of the soul. When, therefore, this man speaks of the shield of faith, we may be quite sure that he is still dwelling near the soul and that he is speaking over protection which will defend the innermost life from foul and destructive invasion. Do we realise that we have a soul these days? It's not found in books of psychology. You can't see it, but we've all got a soul. I'm going to say something that may astound you. 
I believe that I'm never going to die. Amen. I believe that I have eternal life. Amen. And you don't have to die before you experience it. You can start experiencing it now. And whilst the body falls apart, the soul remains. That is the most important thing. And uh, Nick was asking me about the word metanoia. The renewing of mind. It's that inner life. That's the critical thing for all of us. Because if our inner life gets messed up and the battle is raging on, we fall and we're hopeless and we get depressed and despondent and there's absolutely no help for us at all. I hadn't seen that until I started reading about the shield of faith. Because we're all about externals, aren't we? But no, that's not the Christian life. It's about the things that really, really matter. About how we think and feel. It's the thought life. That's where the devil attacks us the most, isn't it? God dear. Now our emphasis is prone to be entirely the other way in the world. You know, just how we are influenced by the world in which we live. And yet we're citizens of the kingdom of God. We're to live a different type of life. And there, because we're so human, we're very apt to misinterpret the teachings of the Apostle Paul and to misunderstand the holy promises of the Lord. We're prone to live in the incidents of life rather than its essentials in its environment rather than in its character, in possessions rather than in personalities, in the body rather than in the soul. The consequence is that we seek our shields in the realms in which we live. We live only in the things of the body and therefore against bodily ills seek shields. We want a shield against sorrow to keep it away, a shield to protect us against becoming unhappy. We want a shield against adversity to keep it away, a shield against the darkening eclipse of a sunny day. We want a shield against loss to keep it away. In the world we live, people only think of gain. We also want a shield against the breakup of good relationships. We want a shield against pain to keep it away. A shield against the pricks and goads of challenging circumstances. And we could say a familiar sentence against the strings and arrows of outrageous fortune. <laughs> we all say that, don't we? In a word, we want a shield to make us comfortable. That's what the world's after. I've just bought a new comfortable chair. Yeah. <laughs> we want our life to be a life of ease. And because the shield of faith does not do that, we're often upset and confused. And our poor understanding is often twisted and broken. And the world will appear to be a, a warren without a providence and without a plan. It's just here that our false emphasis leads us astray. We live in circumstances and seek a shield to make us comfortable. But the apostle lived in character and sought a shield to make him holy. He was not concerned with the arrangement of circumstances but he was concerned with the aspiration of what those circumstances, what they might bring. And they should never bring disaster to his soul. He did not seek a shield to keep off bad circumstances from doing him harm. Instead, he, short us, he sought a shield to defend him from the destructiveness of every kind of circumstance. Paul wanted a shield against all circumstances in order that no circumstance might unman him and impoverish the wealth of his soul. 
Let's think for a moment about a very simple illustration. A ray of, of white light is made up of many different colours, but we can devise screens to keep back any one of those colours and select only those we want. We can filter the rays, or we can devise a screen to let in rays of light and to keep out rays of heat. We can intercept certain rays and forbid their presence. Now, to the Apostle Paul, the shield of faith was a screen to intercept the deadly rays which dwell in every kind of circumstance. And Paul, and to Paul, the deadly rays of circumstances, no matter whether they were good or bad, were just those that concerned his spiritual vulnerabilities and lessened his communion with God, the things that are out of his moral fibre and destroyed the wholeness and wholesomeness of his human understandings and impaired his intimacy with God and man. It was against these deadly rays that he needed a shield and he found it in the shield of faith. I've just been uh, watching J Jules Verne, the uh, War of the Worlds. Do you remember that yeah, film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was deadly rays that were destroying mankind, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But we can filter those rays with the field of, sh of, sh of faith. Now, the older I get, the more I realise that the greatest battles we all face are in our thoughts and in our hearts. External circumstances, although maybe difficult, are far easier to conquer than the thoughts that fill our minds each and every day. Paul wanted a shield, not against failure that might come or stay away, but he wanted a shield against pessimism that might be born of failure, which holds a soul in the fierce bondage of an Arctic winter. Paul wanted a shield not against injury that might come or might stay away, but against the deadly thing that is born of injury, even the foul offspring of revenge. Paul wanted a shield not against pain that might come or might not come, he sought a shield against a spirit of murmuring, which is so frequently born of pain, and the deadly mode of complaint. Paul wanted a shield not against disappointment that might come or might not come, but against the bitterness that is born of disappointment, the mood of cynicism which sours the milk of human kindness and perverts all the gentle currents of the soul. Paul wanted a shield not against difficulty that might come or might not come, but against the fear that is born of difficulty, the cowardness and the disloyalty which are so often bred of remarkable tasks. Paul did not want a shield against success that might come or might not come, but against the pride that is born of success, the deadly vanity of self-conceit, which scorch the fair and gracious things of the soul as a prairie fire snaps up a homestead or a farm. Paul did not want to shield against wealth that might come or might not come, but against the materialism that is born of wealth, the deadly petrifying influence which turns flesh into stone and spirituality into benumbment and which makes a soul unconscious of God and of eternity. The Apostle Paul did not want a shield against any particular circumstance but against every kind of circumstance that in everything he might be defended against the fiery darts of the devil. He found the shield he needed in a vital faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, 
the faith life cultivates the personal fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate concern of faith is not with policy, nor with creed, nor with the church, and not with sacrament, but with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the first thing we have to do if we wish to wear the shield of faith is to cultivate the companionship of the Lord. We must seek his holy presence. We must let his will enter into and possess our minds. And we must let his promises enter and fill our hearts. And we must let our own hearts and minds dwell upon the Lord Jesus in holy thoughts and aspirations, just as our hearts and minds dwell on the loved ones who have died. We must, we must talk to him in secret and we must let him talk to us. We must consult him about our affairs and then take his counsels as our model and pay much more heed to them than the statues will, will become our songs. Faith life cultivates the friendship of Christ and leans upon it and surrenders itself with glorious abandonment to the sovereign decree of his grace and love. And then secondly, the faith life puts first things first. And in its list of primary values, it gives first place to the treasures of the soul. Faith life is more concerned with habits than with things, with character than with office, with self-respect than with popular esteem. Faith life puts first things first, the clean mind and the pure heart. And for these things, it never turns its eyes away. And lastly, faith life contemplates the campaign rather than the single battle. One battle may seem to go against us, but faith knows that one battle is not the end of the world. In John chapter 16 and verse 22 we read, So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Faith takes a longer view, the view of the entire campaign. In Revelation 21 and verse 2, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And in Revelation 11, verse 15, it says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. Hey, fantastic, isn't it? Such a relationship to the Lord protects our life as with an invincible shield. It may please God, it may please God to conduct our life, to conduct our life through long reaches of cloudless noon. Show me, this shield of faith will be our defence. It may please God to lead us through long periods of terrible night, but the shield of faith will be our defence. And here is a wonderful promise to end with today. The Bible is full of promises. Our God is a master promiser and he, he delivers on all of them if we would only claim them. And if you haven't looked it up in your Bible, look up Psalm 91, an amazing psalm, verses 5 to 7. Listen, and when you get home, put it on your fridge. Never let these words depart from you. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Isn't that an amazing promise of God? Aren't we so blessed? 
We're going to sing a wonderful hymn now. I don't know if you know it. My faith looks up to thee, which is number 469.